booktube this is kelly thank you so much for watching my channel books i'm not reading i don't know how well you can tell but i've got my green sweater on and my shamrock earrings because it's saint patrick's day and uh i'm gonna be doing my review today um, for the irish readathon which is how the irish saved civilization by thomas cahill um i have been to the uk um in twice um, the first time I went with uh, a church group and uh, we went to England and we went to uh, Scotland. And the second time I went on a tour with my mother and my grandmother um, and we not only went to England and, and Scotland but we also went to Wales and we went to Ireland. Anyway, but my mom picked this book up while we were on that trip. Uh, the American cover is quite different. Um, and I, I would be curious to see if there's any differences in the um, American edition of this book. But nonetheless, I was very excited to read this book. And um, mainly because this is what I thought it was about, okay? So, um, let's see. <clears throat> Not only did Irish monks and scribes maintain the very record of Western civilization, copying the manuscripts of both pagan and Christian writers, including Homer, Virgil, Plato, and Aristotle, while libraries on the continent were forever lost, they brought their uniquely Irish view of the world to, to the task. As Cahill illustrates, so much of the liveliness we associate with the Middle Ages has its roots in Ireland because that is where the seeds of European culture were germinated anew. So I really thought, and there's, there's another paragraph before that, but for some reason I just honed in on that, and I really thought it was going to be primarily focused on uh, these monks uh, recording the Book of Kells and, and those sorts of things. And instead, <laughs> this, this book, and it's not very long, okay? So if you can see the two bookmarks, um, it has an introduction and seven chapters, okay? Um, it's 218 pages long. And it starts off with Augustine. <laughs> I wish I had some Augustine books here. Um, and, and talking about the end of the Roman um, civilization and how Christianity, uh, you know, Constantinople proclaims himself a Christian and it's more like the Romans decide to be, um, decide to be Christians and, and, and continue on with, you know, I mean, they don't greatly alter their lives. Um, and then... So we start off with Augustine uh, and the end of the Roman Empire, and then we uh, um, briefly talk about the beginning of Ireland. Um, the Celts arrived in Ireland in the 4th century, 4th century um, BC, excuse me, and they, according to their mythology, said there were already people there. Um, they were eventually called the little people who became the leprechauns and fairies of Irish mythology in what's called the Tain. Um, and then we go into Patrick, um, St. Patrick, <laughs> who did not chase snakes out of Ireland, but instead was quite a revolutionary guy. Um, he's the first missionary outside of kind of uh, the Roman Empire outside of, um, yeah, outside of, outside of Roman law. Um, he comes to Ireland in 432, um, and he was really a revolutionary. He speaks out against slavery, and the Irish slave trade um, is, is pretty much comes to a halt. Violence decreases while um, Patrick is in Ireland. Um, he establishes monasteries and, and convents, um, and, and Patrick, uh, was, he was a slave himself, which is part of why he's so opposed to the slave trade, but he also didn't get a very good education, and so he really under, he, in spite of that, he really appreciates how important literacy is, 
um, being able to read, being able to write and record things. And for St. Patrick, he does not object to um, people writing about something other, other than something related to Christ. So, um, you know, people don't just have to read or write or tell biblical stories. Um, they can do things, uh, they, they record their own, their own mythology, right? That's why we have at least some of the Tain. So because of Patrick's focus on literacy and, and allowing people to write their own stories, their own, um, you know, poems and uh, songs and all those kinds of things down, um, and and things are allowed to be written in a vernacular uh, literature. Things are really, uh, Cahill talks about like the Irish really liking to play with language, um, that it's a, it's a playful thing and, and it's fun and um, it should be beautiful, right? Like letters are beautiful, these beautiful things. So, so <laughs> I just want you to know though, like part of my frustration with this book is that that part, like discussing literature and, um, uh, you know, r writing down things like um, Greek and, and Roman literature and pagan literature in addition to their own, um, it comes, uh, it comes on page uh, 158, again, the book's 218 pages long. So we don't get to the part of really talking about recording these books, recording things down, people um, playing with language until, uh, you know, so far into the book. And it isn't that I didn't enjoy learning more about St. Patrick, but I just, I thought that, that I thought we were going to be spending lots of time talking about, um, and it does mention in here, um, oh gosh, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna get this wrong, Skellig, Skellig Michael? I mean, it's, it's this rocky outpost of an island, um, and there was a monastery, and, and yeah, people recorded, they just recorded, um, texts, and, and, and the only reason, Cahill's argument is the only reason that we have them is because of the Irish. Now, there's another another person who played a really big role in why we still have these texts. And that person, in the Irish language, oh my goodness, I'm going to get this wrong, um, Col Seal. Oh, I'm so sorry. But Cahill also says he sometimes referred to St. Columba as St. Columba. And I was like, ooh, that sounds so familiar. Why does that sound so familiar? So, Colm Seal, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I hope my Irish friend, I hope my Irish viewers will forgive me for that. He leaves Ireland and forms a monastery on an island off the coast of Scotland called Iona. And I have been to Iona with my church group, right? I did not, like, this was so far into the book until I made these kind of connections with the places I've been and what happened there and why they were so important. And I mean, it was a really long, it's been a very, very long time since I've been to Ireland or Scotland. Um, Columba, I'm just going to call him Columba, okay? Um, he left Ireland for Iona in 557, and and eventually there were so many people. I mean, it's a, it's a little island, okay? It's not huge. Um, there were so many people there to study under him uh, that he starts send at, that like they kind of reach a capacity, and he starts sending people out. So he starts sending people to Scotland and other parts of England and the continent of Europe. And, um, and that, that is really why we have these books is because, because later the Vikings are going to come and they're going to find these beautiful manuscripts. They're going to destroy them. And so because these Irish people were already out, they were already out in the world with these books that they had copied from other things. Um, 
that's why they that's why they survived. Um, and there's even a quote in here. Wherever they went, the Irish brought with them their books, many unseen in Europe for centuries and tied to their waists as signs of triumph. Just as Irish heroes had once tied their waists with their enemies' heads. There is discussion of human sacrifice among the, the Celts there. Um, wherever they went, they brought their love of learning and their skills in bookmaking. In the bays and valleys of their exile, they reestablished literacy and breathed new life into the exhausted literary culture of Europe. And that is how the Irish saved civilization. Okay, so, um, show, show and tell time. So, um, this is a picture um, from Iona of a Celtic cross. And here's my little, I always did this, I always bought like the little touristy books. <laughs> I have so many of them. Um, but here's, yeah, here's a map of Iona. It's, it's small though. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's not a, not a large place. Just the Abbey. So I, <laughs> I was really frustrated with the book most of the time. Um, because I wanted it to, to spend time talking about, um, talking about recording these manuscripts. And, it, oh, I know one other thing. We haven't talked about the Book of Kells, which is probably the most famous, the fam most famous thing. And there's a picture of it. There's a picture in the book, but it's in black and white. Uh, here's a page from the Book of Kells. Make sure you guys can see that. So, I mean, yes, that is um, uh, the most famous one of these books that um, the Irish created. There are others, um, and some of them are scattered in, in libraries around the world now that, that, were, that were able to be saved. Uh, so, so this book, it was frustrating because, A, it took so long to get to... The manuscript part, right? Like again, I didn't object to learning more about Patrick, Saint Patrick, um, but that's not really. And I, I certainly did not like. I mean, there's so much discussion of the Roman Empire at the beginning of it, and and I just, I was like, when are we gonna get to Ireland? <laughs> like that's why I'm reading this. That's where I want to be. I want to, I want to go there. Um, so I, I know some of you really love and appreciate this book and I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section down below. Um, and I, yeah, I, I, I want to believe Thomas Cale. <laughs> I want to believe that the Irish saved civilization, but I'm not sure like that's the one hinge, but maybe, maybe it is like, maybe I'm wrong. Um, I don't know. I just felt like he he kind of inserted himself into the book a few times in a way that I didn't really feel like was appropriate for um, nonfiction and um, you know I mean sometimes like I I felt like his own religious beliefs were were coming through and again. I obviously I understand like I mean why why else would he maybe write this book but I, I just it, it just didn't feel quite it just didn't feel quite right and it wasn't it wasn't very often but it just the few times that it did happen it was I don't know it was just a little off-putting so anyway I really want to hear what you guys have to think what you have to say about this book um if you've read it or yeah, like if you know a lot more about the subject, because obviously, like this is not this is not a huge book. Um, there's not. Yeah, I I just felt like Thomas Cahill could have spent so much more time. Um, and maybe there's another book out there. This was published in 1995, so maybe there's another book that's since been published that elaborates more upon that and makes a stronger argument for it. Um, but I was really, really excited, um, to make the connection to Iona and Scotland. Um, and that was, yeah, that was just really, so that, that like my own personal experience, like helped, helped bump up the book, I guess. Um, because I, I 
been, I knew, I knew that place. I, I felt a connection to that place. And, and I really feel like Cahill is saying that it's not so much that it's, that it's Ireland, but that it's, it's the Irish leaving Ireland and, um, and, and, and sharing their knowledge and their literacy with the rest of the world. So, all right, I look forward to your comments down in the comment section. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Remember to be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and I will talk to you soon, booktube. Take care, bye.